So Cricket Life Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Today we're joined by Jeetan Patel. How's it going? Yeah, good, mate. Um, good. It's nice to be back in New Zealand. So let's start where it all began for yourself. In terms of cricket, was that always your main passion as a youngster? Oh, look, mate, I, I started when I was three, you know, uh, coming from an Indian background. Um, my dad loved cricket. He talks about how he used to play. I can't imagine it was at a high level, even though he'd talk himself up. But, um, you know, he lived in India for a long time before moving to England and followed county cricket, loved obviously watching England play, um, big fan of India. Got married, moved to New Zealand, and then um, my parents had me, and and I was the, the first child, and so therefore I got sort of thwarted with cricket uh, down the hallway and got a little bat when I was two, um, a little signature bat actually from one of my uncles, and ever since then it's, you know, bat or ball in hand, and um, from there I suppose my passion grew. Who were your heroes growing up? Oh, mate, it's pretty hard to go past Sir Richard Hadley, especially as a young kid growing up in New Zealand. Um, you know, I was a, a bustling little seamer. I wasn't ever going to be rapid, um, although I suppose when I was 10, I thought I was pretty quick. Um, yeah, so, you know, watching Sir Richard Hadley go through what he did, uh, you know, that 92 World Cup and all those years round where he was amazing. And then for him to go on to play uh, a long, successful career at Knotts as well was, you know, it was kind of someone that I put on a pedestal until I probably started bowling off spin. Um, but even then, his professionalism was probably something that carried through with me. And when did you first take to the art of off spin? Yeah, it's funny. It's weird how it all started. Um, just mucking around in the nets. Uh, it's, it's school training. Um, we used to have to play for our schools as opposed to playing for clubs. We weren't allowed to play for clubs um, up until we left school, um, back in my time anyway which is a few what, years ago now. What was the reason for that? Just uh, I think I think they wanted to have uh, inter-school sports to be strong. Um, they didn't want... They wanted basically the best of the best were allowed to play at league cricket, but they also didn't want them to be intimidated by men um, too early age. age. Um, and it also meant it brought the school together. So, you know, for example, in Wellington, we had 10, 12 colleges that would compete each other competing against each other every year and so we had a big competition um we could play enough cricket 50 over cricket two day cricket um so it was there was lots on and and obviously it meant that the the age group reps could then still go around and pick their players who they wanted to play for wellington at different age groups but it meant they're all in one place i suppose so it made it easier to compete against each other and and you were tested more against your peers than you were against the elders and look did, does it hold people back i don't know um I don't haven't done any studies on it, but um, but yeah. So school training, um, mucking around in the nets with the guys. I'd finished bowling, finished batting, so I started bowling with some off spin. And come Saturday afternoon, and we need someone to bowl spin. And um, captain thought, "Look, you're the guy who did it the best on the, during the week in the nets. So here you have a go." And and it came out all right. Um, and I suppose from there, I went to rep training that afternoon. Uh, sorry, that next week and. They asked me to continue on with it um, just to see how it would go and where it would progress. And 20 years, 20, 25 years later, um, you know, I've decided to stop bowling. So when did Wellington first recognise your talents and this, how did you get into the system? <clears throat> yeah, so just through school cricket. Um, obviously, so in Wellington, you've got obviously the, the colleges, but they're also, well, the high schools. Um but then they become, they get into regions within themselves. So then there's eastern suburbs, northern suburbs, da 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 um, And then they play in a little competition on a Sunday. And from there, the rep teams get picked. And I, look, I was 14, 13, 14 when I first got my call up. Um, again, as a seamer then. But then uh, the year after in the under 15s, under 16s, I think it was two years later, um, I started bowling off spin. And I went to the under 16 tournament, which is the New Zealand tournament for all the provinces and um was was the off spinner there and funny enough um graham welsh and dougie brown were my head coaches um okay. were my coaches at that, at that age group and you know to think 20 years later they were still my coaches was uh, is quite weird and then so when you first made your debut for the first team you got a fifer against auckland took the professional game like a dr water no, I didn't, mate. No, it was hard work. It was really hard work. Um, look, 
I I went to the under-19 tournament, did really well. And prior to that, I'd been in the squad. So I was lucky enough to be around the big guys. And it was pretty, pretty sort of all grabbing really i mean to be around guys that i thought were my heroes um to now have to train with them was was quite exciting but um uh, i got picked yeah my first year i only played red bull cricket but we only had five games in that back in those days when we used to play five first class games um and got to go to auckland and play against auckland and we we lost a toss and bowled on a really flat wicket um i ended up bowling sort of 55 overs i think um in the first innings and you know, if you bowl enough balls, you're a chance of getting enough wickets, I suppose. But, um, but yeah, got five for a uh, pretty proud moment because Dad was in the stands. He was he was jumping up and down like a, like a hooligan. But, um, no, it was good fun, mate. And, you know, those memories still stick with me now. Who else was in your side? Any big black cat names? Uh, I can't really remember too much, mate. Mark, uh, James Franklin, obviously the head coach of Durham now, played for New Zealand. Um there were guys that were, to be fair, it was a, quite an old bunch of guys that was that was in the side. Matthew Bell, who went on to play for New Zealand, Mark Gillespie. Um, a lot, yeah, just a lot of good friends. Um, a lot of guys I grew up with, um, but also a lot of senior players who I knew nothing about. So it was quite weird to be in this environment where I knew two or three guys that were um, of my age but had been playing already um, to then you know, the senior guys who were on their way out of their careers. And, and at that age, I didn't really understand what it meant to, to leave a career of cricket. Um, and those guys had given so much to the game. But, you know, looking back, it's pretty emotional, the times they went through. And then, yeah, you won the title in 2000, 2001, and then 2003, four season. Was that just, um, you know, as a youngster, installing that winning mentality? What makes up a side? That um, that goes on to what the qualities that that, that did that side possess that won the title. Oh, there's so many qualities, mate. But we just had guys who stood up at the right time. Um, I think everyone throughout that competition that year, everyone contributed in it. And ultimately, I mean, I know cricket's played by individuals, but it's actually won by teams. Um, and when I say that, it's about the group contribution. We had guys who were knocking on New Zealand's door. We had guys who had come back from New Zealand. We had guys who were aspiring for more as individuals. But ultimately, we had a group of guys who really wanted to play for each other and hang out with each other. And I was still very young at that age, uh, 23, 24. And I know that doesn't sound young now, but, you know, it is still very young in a cricket career. Um, so I didn't really get, understand it all. All I knew was I was part of something very special. We worked really hard really really hard and we had some really tough days um we got put through the ringer but look so big guys stood up at the right times and and it meant that we had opportunities to to go on to win a title you touched on age there as a spinner do spinners mature uh later as opposed to you know young fast bowlers do you have any views oh, on that i think um i think that word mature is probably changed a little bit i think the, the level of maturity in terms of behaviors is probably different now i think kids now are a bit more mature in terms of around their behavior professionalism and bits and pieces i mean i was a larrikin when i was a kid 23 i wasn't really enjoying life you know i got to play cricket for a living so i had the dream life um but i think in terms of spin that the skill part of maturing is different again where you just need to the way i like to put it is you need to bowl enough balls um, and by 23, 24, I know I hadn't, um, not at the highest level, you know, and that's, that's the one thing it, it's, you need to be able to bowl enough balls at the highest level. Well, I say the highest level, the, the level you're at to be able to go on to the next level. It's a bit like a, um, a computer game or a PlayStation game. You need to do it time and time again to pass the level before you then go on to the next one. And, and I think that's where the, maturity that word maturity comes in is it's the skill maturity and understanding right what is it that i've got how do i use it and why do i use it when um and then once i've understood that right i go to the next level and i do it all again so is it just a case as, as people do say you do all the bowling in the nets but nothing matches that game intensity nothing nothing matches game intensity but there's also a very big space for bowling in the nets and bowling at training and, and that's another learning opportunity i think what what we 
as people do, we'll tend to play games and look at outcome. Um, and we forget about how the process works, which is where training is so important because that gives us opportunity to look at how our processes are and how we affect them under pressure. And there's ways to put people under pressure at training um, and put yourself under pressure. So to be able to do that, emulate it, so that come game day, it just becomes second nature. And then that's what I mean by bowling enough balls is so that when you come to play games where it does get pressure moments, um, you've bowled enough, you've understood enough about who you are and what you are, that when it comes to competing, you can just go and compete. You know, you can just play the guy at the other end. Yeah, do you have any tips for youngsters, say club cricketers, that want to emulate that type of pressure that, you know, when they go out on a Saturday, are they, that they're not really at the moment replicating during their training? Anything they can do? Any advice yeah. that you have? Oh, look, I, I had a pretty simple regime personally, and, I, and everyone's different. But for me, my, my regime was pretty simple towards the back end of my career anyway. Not that I'd worked it out, but, um, but I'd worked where I was um, and what I needed. And I think that's the biggest part is we go up going to cricket training, uh, warming up, playing football, which I hate. <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of sports ga or games before at warm-ups, but that's the old nature of me, old boy nature of me, probably because I'm uncoordinated when it comes to that stuff. Um, yeah, and then we go to the nets and we go and train and we wait for our time to bat. Uh, when the coach says, mate, you put your pads on, you go bat, otherwise you bowl until then and then we're just fulfilling at the end of it. Boom, training's over, we go home. Um, but actually rocking up to training with a plan, uh, and working out, right, what is it exactly I need? Um, and to be able to do that, you have to have to explore a lot of different avenues to work out what it, ex what it is exactly you might need as an individual. Um, for me, it was I needed to work on my core skill every day. I needed to work on my Red Bull, what, it, what is the perfect delivery for me? Um, and I need to make sure that that was down packed every day before I went into a, a challenging session where I wanted to get guys out or I wanted to... Um, set KPIs or uh, put cones down and work out um, what my percentages were, um, get people to chat, to video me, challenge me with, you know, where my action is, how the ball's coming out, what is happening at the other end. And they're all different things that I would do at different times of the week um, or, or the year. Uh, you know, some days I just didn't want to do anything because I didn't feel it was going to help me. And to be able to get to that point is a pretty strong position to be in, um, to be able to say, look, today I'm not bowling today or I, I don't see the point in it because it's not going to help me. Um, but there's other, plenty other days I will say, you know, there's probably three, there's only probably three or four days in a year you could say that, but most of the other days that, um, you know, there's always something to work on. And then that 2004-05 season, mm. there was a game against Otago where you got six for, do you think that was one of the games that really propelled you into the international reckoning? No, I don't. I don't know, mate. I don't know. Um, look, you remember my stuff better than I do, but um, I, I don't know. I, look, I loved, I just love taking wickets and playing playing games for Wales and win, winning games for Wales at that point. Um, I hadn't thought about playing for New Zealand or anything beyond that. Uh, you know, I'd been in uh, camps along the way, and I, you know, probably my best learning was going to Sri Lanka um, as a net bowler with a New Zealand team. That was pretty cool. Uh, you know, we got to bowl. Me and another friend or a friend, me and another colleague got to bowl for four weeks against the test team in Sri Lanka on t in tough conditions, but we weren't part of the squad. So we were just net bowlers on a tour. And I, I guarantee you that was my biggest learning is to be able to, to bowl against the best in New Zealand. Um, so that was probably where it sparked, where I thought maybe I could do this, maybe, you know, if things went my way, but I had to earn that. Um, and, you know, sixers, fifers, threefers, fourfers, whatever it is, there is a little bit of luck in that. Uh, yes, there's got to be some skill, but there is a little bit of luck in how that pans out as well. And right time, right place, maybe. So I was lucky enough to be able to do that. How much of an influence was John Bracewell on your career? Huge, huge. He set down some really big markers for me. Um, uh, he was quite an authoritarian uh, in terms of as a coach. He wanted it his way. Um, but towards the back end, he opened up a little bit more. And I suppose he was tough on me because I was quite um, an out there character that liked to have some fun and enjoyed touring life, playing golf and, you know, going to lovely restaurants, being in these amazing stadiums and playing cricket. And so touring life was all about fun for me. And he also wanted me to make sure that my cricket was progressing along the way. Um, 
So he was quite hard initially, but uh, that set some really good um, standards for me uh, to make sure that being professional, um, the levels of professional requ professionalism required to play cricket at the highest level, you know, they're really important. They are um, being on time, all those really small things um, to making sure that your kit's right, to making sure that everything is aligned so that you can then go and perform. There is no worrying about anything on the outside world. Um, and when I mean perform, really just challenge yourself to keep getting better every day. And he did that. Um, so he set some good boundaries for me. Uh, well, some some good standards for me. And then we, we just, we to be fair, we didn't really talk much spin. We just talked about um, how we're going to play the game. You know, times to be aggressive, times to be defensive. But um, but other than that, it was it was more about him just getting me in the game and, and wanting for me to be uh, who I was off the park, on the park. And then when you got your debut, <clears throat> one day debut, 2005 against Zimbabwe, proud moment? Yeah, hugely proud moment. I remember um, it was uh, it was sort of the sort of spring, I mean, autumn time in New Zealand when I got the phone call to say, look, I was going to Zimbabwe um, and I couldn't believe it. I don't know where it came from, but obviously I was pretty excited, 25-year-old and um, first person to call was dad and he was obviously pretty chuffed. Um, he didn't give me much then, which disappointed me. <coughs> but um, but I remember the weekend before we left, we had a whole lot of family and friends around for a big barbecue and and um, it was quite an emotional time because they put in so much time and effort into my career so far, uh, right from when I was a 13-year-old to where I am a 25-year-old, from drop-offs to sacrifices to, you know, supporting me, to running me through good times and bad, to, um, to being there when I needed them, to obviously just backing off when I didn't need them. So they, it was a good time to be able to thank them all. And, and I think that was the, probably the, the proudest moment was to be able to say, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to be able to live my dream. Um, but then the next part, which is the really hard part, was when I got to Zimbabwe and um, I had to play against the world's best. Yeah, so 2006, you also got your test cap. Now, what are your views on test cricket? Uh, is it, in your opinion, the, uh, the pinnacle of the sport? Oh, completely, mate. By, by a long, long way. I would rather watch. In fact, um, I was watching some state, state cricket on TV last night. I don't know. I've never done that before, but I suppose isolation is a funny thing that people... Um, no, I love Red Bull cricket. I think Test cricket's the most amazing um, form of cricket going around. You know, it's nice to be able to play T20 cricket. And don't get me wrong, I, I actually really enjoy 50-over cricket, but four days, five days of hard craft... Um, that chess game, that, you know, constant manoeuvring for position, it's it's awesome. And, you know, to get my test cap by, by given to me by, um, well, presented to me by Richie, the great Richie McCall was pretty special. Oh, wow. okay. uh, in Cape Town. Yeah, that's special. Um, yeah. But, so in terms of um, as a spinner from the shorter form one day and the test, test arena, what are the fundamental differences and when I mean that I'm talking about say like field possession positions that you have to set variations all that kind of stuff can you just give us a little insight into your mind when you know going into both it varies again 2020 cricket to 50 over cricket to four day cricket obviously we all know that Red Bull cricket takes a long time so being as patient as you can over long periods of time um that's probably that that end of the scale to the T20 league where you've got 24 balls and ultimately, you know, if you're taking three wickets in your 24 balls, then you're pretty much lining up a match winner role, um, match winning contribution. But it's sort of 20, for me, 2020 is one ball at a time. It is, you know, 24 balls and making sure that they're bang on. And even when they're bang on, they can still disappear. You know, our best balls are spinners, to be fair should get parked for six um, most of the time. But because we can play a game with a batter in terms of the fields we set, in terms of the the aura they have, in terms of who they're facing and whatever, it's, there's different circumstances. But I think 50 over cricket's a great little um, melting pot to understand it all, where you've got 10 overs um, to contribute. 50 overs is quite a long time, 300 balls in a game minimum, where you're jostling for position, but ultimately you're still trying to take wickets along the way. 
So there's that balance of aggression and defensiveness within that. And that, that can vary within overs, within balls. You know, you may defend balls one and two of the over, attack balls three and four, and defend balls five and six. And and when I say that, I don't think you bowl any different. Um, I just think the fields change. You may have guys catching it with wickets or catching a cover or a slip or a, even a bat pad or, you know, a leg slip. Or you may put them all back and put them back on the ring and say, look, you defend one now. Um, do you know, it's that jostling of now only four guys out of the ring in that middle period. Um, where are you promoting guys to want to hit the ball? So it might be asking guys to hit over mid off. It might be asking guys to sweep because they're not big sweepers. It might be asking guys to to cut because they're not they're, they're more likely to go to the leg side. You know, it's it's then playing a game within a game in fifty over cricket. And I think that's where it's probably the easiest way to describe. Um, the variances in the game from red ball to T20 because T20 there is a lot of defensive, red ball there's a lot of attacking, but in 50 over cricket there's that mixed match with both. Can you talk about the subtle differences you had in terms of variations? So obviously you've got your stop ball, but then what other things did you have in your armory that perhaps one like myself looking on in the TV didn't really pick up on? Yeah, look, I mean, it's there's no... It's no um, amazing feet or anything it's you know no rocket science but to be honest with you it's all just angle of seam so for us spinners you know ultimately we want our seam to be at 45 and um especially in england anyway we want it to be at 45 because there is most of the time it spins i feel but we still need to get the ball to bounce um so to get the ball at 45 degree and to be able to get the ball to land on on the seam at 45 degree is probably perfect and then being able to change that angle so therefore uh, the more it gets to, to 90, the more, obviously, um, more topspin we put on it, more sides we put on it that way. So are we asking the ball to spin more and bounce less or are we asking the ball to spin less and bounce more? And that's probably, you know, that's that's it with those angles, really. It's, there's no much more than that. There might be a little arm ball, which is different again for different guys, how they access that. Some like to get the ball to come out the front of their hands and get it to shape a bit more. Some like to get it to come out like a saucer. Um, and the theory behind that is a bit like baseball, where it should, if you get enough revolutions on it, it should start to rise. But a cricket ball is different to a baseball, um, you know, and it's a shorter pitch, so it doesn't have that time. But ultimately, it looks it looks shorter than it is. Um, probably plays when you, when the ball comes out perfectly with that slider, it probably looks shorter than this. The guys go back more often when it is actually a ball to go forward to. What are your views on youngsters trying to develop the ball that goes the other way you know, as an off spin of the Dusra? Maybe it's the Murali and Ashwin influence, but is that something you would encourage a youngster to work on as well? Or would it just be a case of mastering your stop ball, your your craft, and then, then working on the subtleties after? What are your views and advice for that on that on that subject yeah, well, i mean it's a good question you know kids these days can do whatever they want um like for me it's it's a bit of both you have to explore you have to explore how far you can go with your app but if you don't i don't believe i believe if you don't have a core skill that you can go to every day of the week at every moment and every day um that you can trust in then how can you use your variations um because ultimately, when we're under pressure, what do we default to? We default to who we know, who we are and what we know. Um, and so, therefore, we need to be able to make sure that that skill is as best as it can be. And I was watching the All Blacks the other day, and they were, they were talking about how um, their basic skill was a lot better than the weekend before, where they're catching their passing. And, and that's what I'm talking about, is that their basic skill. What is their basic skill? If I'm a league spinner, what is my basic skill? And, and, and can I nail that all the time? Um, before I start to look at how am I going to bowl my wrong and um, my slide on my zoot or whatever they want to call it. Um, and the same with same with finger spinners as well. Now, these guys who are at their, at their peak understand their core skill and they know, I like to call it core skill or stock ball. They know it so well that they can then start to add into that. But they also know when adding into it, there is that level of um, their there is an ability for that to affect our stock ball. So we have to make sure that we're constantly training that before we also add in these little things. But as I said, if you're willing to start young enough, um, you know, and you're not, when I was trying to do it at 28, 29 and almost bust my shoulder, 
um, it's a bit stupid then, but I think when you're, when you're young enough, you can explore and go and have some fun because that's what, you know, that's what cricket is ultimately. And as kids, you know, the one thing I'd love to see is kids back on the street playing cricket again, because it's, it's something that's just not done anymore. And, you know, playing in the backyard with an all the neighbors round, um, I'd love my kids to be able to do that as well. And in 2007, played a lot of one day cricket, but it was 2000, it was until 2008 that you got your next test appearance. Obviously you're in the same size, same squad as Daniel Vittori. How did you find that mentally being around the squad, but not getting your chance in the test side? <clears throat> really difficult. Um, if I'm honest with you, really difficult. And, you know, a lot of people sh would say that, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm lucky enough to be there. Yeah, I was lucky enough to be there and I, I, I'll never take that away. But um, once you get a taste of something, you want always want a little bit more, that addictive nature of people. Um, and I wanted more of it. And I, I didn't think I was bowling poorly. I just, things just weren't happening my way. Um, you know, we had obviously playing in New Zealand. We're not going to play on many spin friendly wickets. Um we're going to have to get really lucky if we're going to do that as spinners. But but I, I, either I was going to be better than Dan um, or he was going to get injured, which I would never hope for, um, or we'd play on spin for any wickets. And, and ultimately, Dan was, you know, Dan was probably what is still one of the best finger spinners in the world um, in terms of what he did for the game. So I was lucky to – I was happy enough to play second fiddle to him. Um, so it was difficult. I played a lot of my games at training, which was hard. Um but I cherished every moment I got to go back to Wellington and play because I thought these are, these are opportunities to express who I am, how I want to be. And maybe I put too much pressure on myself in those times because not always did it go my way. And then 2008, six for against West Indies. But 2009, the love affair with Warwickshire. Talk us through it, how it started. How did the approach come about? Yeah, so in 2008, we were on tour to England and um, I played the two warm-up games because the IPL had just started and the guys arrived, were always going to arrive 10 days late from the IPL. Um, so in that 10 days, we had a warm-up game, a couple of warm-up games, I played those. And then I didn't play again for... I didn't play another game for eight weeks. Um, so I was just on tour. <laughs> you know, I was just bag man, doing all the doing all the graft. Um, I lost my way a little bit, which I think is understandable. Um, in hindsight, it's probably understandable, but look, that's, that's what happens. It's professional sport. You're trying to win games cricket. Um, and I didn't fit in the 11 at the time, so that was fine. And then um, I met a, an agent through Stephen Fleming, uh, Stephen Fleming's agent, Darren Long, who's now become a really good friend of mine. Um, and... We hit it off and he said, look, do you want to join? I said, yeah, fine. Look, I've got no skin off my nose. Why not? Um, I don't lose anything. So he went out on the look hunt for me. And um, I think it was one late night in January back in New Zealand. Um, I never really turned my phone off. I always turn my phone off when I go to sleep or put it on silent. For some reason, I didn't. Um, and the phone rang in the middle of the night. And um, Longy was like, look, would you like to go to Warwickshire? And I was like, yeah, Okay. <laughs> I was still half asleep, not thinking about what was going on. And then it sort of dawned on me what was happening. Um, full season, the works um, get you over. And as soon as your season finishes and you kick on into it. And yeah, I didn't get back to sleep then. I was pretty excited about it. How did you find bowling <clears throat> on English pitches? Were they different? To, how much did they differ to the pitches back in New Zealand as a spinner? Mm, yeah, look, um, well, first of all, when I, my first year, I really struggled with the Duke's ball. Um, I didn't I didn't really enjoy it, to be honest with you. Know, in fact, I really hated it. Um, and I what didn't bowl very well. Is it, just, is it just the seam? Is it bigger in the hand? Can you just describe the differences? Uh, look, initially, initially, the ball feels smaller, um, which is great. Uh, when it's brand new, it feels smaller than a red kookaburra. Um, the seam's probably a bit more pronounced. Um, I'd only you been used to be buying kookaburra balls, so it was a bit different. But as the game progresses, I feel the Duke's ball gets swells a bit and gets bigger, um, and the kookaburra stays the same. The seam on the kookaburra gets flatter very quickly, whereas the seam on the Duke's ball stays pronounced a bit more. Um, so I should really enjoy bowl. I should have really enjoyed bowling with the Duke's, but it just didn't feel right. Um, I had a really good white ball season because we were playing with kookaburras, but uh, I didn't really get the red ball at the time. Um, so I think, first of all, in 2009, it was the ball for me. But but in terms of the wickets, 
in New Zealand they're a lot harder, uh, a lot grassier. When I say grassier, they they have a even nature of grass over the wicket and in a very hard soil underneath. So it doesn't really do much. Um, the ball doesn't really have an opportunity to sit in the wicket, to grip and then to spin. Um, whereas over in England, I've always found that most wickets will spin purely because I believe that most wickets are either over-prepared um, and therefore they've been rolled too much and the grass is dead on them now. So therefore the ball has a chance to grip and the seam is more pronounced, so it does sit in the wicket better. Or underprepared, and therefore they're still a bit damp, um, and they haven't been rolled enough, and therefore they're still a bit soft, so the ball sits in the wicket and spins early, and then they drive very quickly, and it spins again at the back end. So I've always, personally, I've always gone to grounds thinking, yeah, this will spin. Um, it's just when. Um, and that's why probably towards my back end of my career, I'd come on to bowl quite early, you know, usually first change to see if there's anything there initially, and then it'll be an arm wrestle to try and get the ball out of my hands, really. A lot of commentators say that spinners, when they come on, they need to find the right pace. Can you actually describe what that actually means and how you actually do do, do find the right pace in a pitch? Yeah, well, <clears throat> when, they, when they talk about the pace in the pitch, well, for spinners anyway, <clears throat> it's more how... Um, how the ball reacts out of the wicket. So when we bowl a ball and it's too slow through the air, it's going to stop, well, it's going to hit the wicket, slow up again. Um, that's just natural physics, isn't it? Because there's a friction. Um, so what we don't want is to be able to give the batter too much time to be able to make a decision whether to go forward and then move back again or go back and then come forward again. Um, we don't want them to have all that time off the wicket to be able to read, has it spun, has it not spun, and therefore, do I go back, do I go forward, where do I hit it? Basically, where do I hit it? We also don't want it to be the other side of the spectrum where the ball reacts too quickly, because if it reacts too quickly, it hasn't had time to sit in the wicket and spin and grip. So that grip might mean that it doesn't spin, but it just sits enough in the wicket to be able to check someone's shot. Um, to be able to stop someone throwing their hands through the ball, to be able to make sure they're defending more often than not. Um, and if it gets that opportunity to spend time in the wicket, then it has a chance to spin or to bounce. So it's that real fine balance of what has this wicket got today, right now, that I need to use. And I always found, I was really lucky enough to have um, one of the best keepers in county cricket, I believe, um, who's recently retired as well, is Tim Ambrose, because... He could read the game for me at that end. So I can read the game from my end in terms of what I'm seeing, how a batter sets up, um, where he's looking to go with his shoulders, his hips, how he looks to come forward or back. But from behind the wicket, Tim Ambrose gets to see what the batter sees. So he gets to see how the ball arrives, um, how it's reacting in the wicket, and then what's from there. So we would always have a discussion after after my first over, is the pace okay? Um, yes or no slower, quicker. Um, look, there's enough there. We could probably really fire it in today. Um, I'm going to have to get this above above the eyes a bit more to be able to hit the wicket a bit better. Um, fuller, shorter, right. Okay, how? what lines do we want to bowl? And so we would always have, every over almost, we'd always have this conversation about, right, okay, where, what is, what are all the factors? Let's put it all into a melting pot and find out exactly what it is we need to do on this wicket today. And then, on the field for Warwickshire, winning the championship 2012, the T20 2014 highlights in your career as well? Oh, mate, winning, winning trophies is always a highlight, mate. I, I think, you know, especially coming from a nation who loves to win trophies, um, you know, it's it's amazing to be able to win all those win all those competitions with all my mates. And I think that's the one thing that we forget is the people we win it with, um, but also the times we didn't win. Uh, and they don't have to be losses, they can be draws. I think they're probably just as much the most important times in my career. Um, the learnings we had from them, the the heartache. Um, you know, you, you've got guys scoring hundreds and guys taking five for sixes, but still not being able to get over the line in it. And they're the emotions that make winning trophies or winning games more important, uh, more excitable. And, I'll tell you now, there's, there's no better feeling than a changing room when someone's won a Red Bull game of cricket. 
whether it's four days or five days or three days or two days, because it takes so much work. It takes so much effort from everyone involved. Um, but to win over a long period of time like that, it's it's amazing to to have the ups on day one to the lows of day two and all the way up and all the way down, all the way up and all the way down. But to come out on top, pretty special times, mate. So what was the story in 2015? So New Zealand, you got the you got a, a, a potential recall with New Zealand, but you chose to stay on with Warwickshire. Can you just expand on that on that story? What happened there? <clears throat> yeah, it was 2014, mate. Um, so I'd been out of the New Zealand team for a while. Um, I've been bowling well again, uh, so I just I got back to bowling as well as I'd like to bowl. Um, 2012, 2013, probably into the start of 2014, I was bowling as well as I, I felt like I could. Um, the ball was coming out really well and I was taking wickets back home, which, you know, it's, it's a tough art to do in New Zealand. Um, not, not to talk myself up too much there, but... Um, and then we had our little girl, our first little girl. She was born at the end of February, so she was just over four weeks old when we arrived in the UK. Um, and we were first-time parents. We don't really know. We didn't. There's no manual. Um, you know, there's no notebook as to what to do when. So we had to. We travelled across the world with her and uh, moved into a flat, um, which was beautiful. Which was a lovely place, and you know, we just settled down and. And I get this email because they've been trying to call me, but they couldn't get through for some reason. So they got this email saying that we want you to go to the West Indies. And I, I wasn't ready. Um, I didn't think that was on the cards in any way. I, you know, I was lucky and I should never have, you know, people should never knock those opportunities, but timing is, timing is really important. Um, and that time wasn't right for me and, and my family. And, um, I spoke to the wife about it. She was really keen for me to go, but I did say that, you know, it's going to be six weeks and you're going to have to go home um, and you're going to have to take Nia with you and then, you know, probably come back here after. And and it was just going to be really difficult for, for us as a family. And I really wanted to be around my wife and my daughter for that initial period. Um, we were just finding our feet at the club and becoming really uh, enthralled in how the club worked. So I went into went into work that day and um, and pulled Dougie Brown in the office and said, "Look, mate, this is what's happened." Um, and you know, I wasn't convinced. I think he could see it on my face. He was like, "You don't know, look overly excited by it." And I said, oh, "Look, trust me, I'm excited by um, being recognised to be be able to go on this tour, but it just it doesn't feel right." Um, and the club, you know, were awesome. Um, they ended up giving me, you know, we, we came to a, we had a discussion around it and, and they said, look, if you don't, if you don't go, then, you know, we'll, we'll look at re-signing you for next year as well. And I was like, wow. Um, and that literally came out of the blue and I've always wanted security. I just got a young family. Um, we needed some security around what was happening. And I knew that if I went on this tour of the West Indies, that the best thing that could happen would be a one year contract. And yes, it's a New Zealand contract, but um, but two years to be able to play the game I love, to be able to travel the world with my family, um, guaranteed. It was pretty hard to turn down. So I took that option instead. And, and you know, I mentioned to them that Mark Craig should go instead. Um, he was bowling really well as well. And he went over and had a successful tour. So I'm really grateful that he had his opportunity and he deserved it. He'd, he'd put in a lot of hard yards to be able to get there. Um, and he had a great time when he was there. And it was a shame that... Andrews hit him later in his career, but um, but look, it was it was a tough decision to make, but ultimately, I feel like it was the right one. Yeah, you mentioned Mark Craig and injuries. An injury to him got you an opportunity um, to go and tour um, India. I mean, you played the second Test match at Eden Gardens. Mm. How, how was that playing out there in front of that crowd? Oh, mate, so pretty similar circumstance. You know, we just we just had a second child, um, and. Oh, not just, but he was almost a year old and uh, the season had just ended in, in England. Um, and we were due home, due to fly home in a week's time from England. I just organised this amazing golf trip for the boys and I was pretty excited about going on. Um, I'd been in the supermarket, bought my whiskey for the golf trip and I was really excited. I got home and as I was driving home, the phone was ringing um, and on the on the screen came up uh, Gavin Larson, who was a selector at the time. And I thought, oh, oh bugger. You know, something's happened. Um, 
and I, and I spoke to him, he said, look, Mark Craig's gone down. I think it was his back or no, his knee or something. Something wasn't right. Um, and he said, look, can you come over? Uh, I didn't know, really know what to do. I said, look, I'll give you a call back. Because um, by then I was ready again. I, I wanted to play and I knew I was, I knew where I was with my game. Like it, I think the prior times in my career, I wasn't really 100% sure where my game was at. Um, I wasn't as confident as I was in what I was doing. Um, so I got back to the house and said to Kate, uh, look, what do you think? She said, go for it. You know, you've given it up once before. You want to do it, so go and do it. So I, I went and, you know, Kate travelled home with the kids. She's amazing for doing that. Um, and she's been amazing, <laughs> to be fair, for a long time, putting up with my rubbish. Um, but, yeah, went to Eden Gardens and I'd gone from 16 degrees in Solly Hole to... Um, 20 degrees in Calcutta that day when I arrived, you know, um, went to training and it was fine. It was overcast and it was a bit chilly. And I thought, oh, this isn't actually as bad as I thought it would be. Um, get named in the, in the 11. We lose a toss and bowl, just like every other opposition team, team seems to do in India. Um, and by lunchtime, it was 40 odd degrees. Humidity was up 90%. And I didn't really know where I was. I was, you know, so, um, so far in the bush, I suppose you could say, uh, that I didn't know what was going on and where I was. So just fortunately, if I bowled enough overs that season to go into autopilot um, and I didn't have to think, I could just bowl. Um, I remember coming in at lunchtime and just looking around the chamber room thinking, where am I? Um, so delusioned by what was going on. Got some food in me, got some fluids in me and, and I was okay. But um, it was... It was cool to go back and have another crack at it when I felt like I was at um, the better side of my career. And, you know, I didn't embarrass myself. So <laughs> I think we, you know, we obviously lost the series, but um, I was quite quite happy with how I went personally. Yeah, the following year of that summer, New Zealand <clears> summer, you also played on your home ground test match. Was that one of the highlights of your career as well? Oh, of Maybe course so. Of course, mate. Um, you know, there's so many, so many good times, so many times that, um, like I've said before, that, you know, the tough times make the good times. But playing a test match on the base reserve is something I dreamed of as a 12 year old. Um, so to be able to fulfill that was pretty special um, to have my family, friends, everyone come down and, and sit on the bank and watch me play cricket on New Zealand's most picturesque ground was was amazing. Um, we didn't play as well as we'd like to, but look, that's hap that happens in cricket. Um, yeah, but it was cool. And I look forward to being that spectator now, um, now that I've retired. I look forward to, to sitting on the bank and watching the boys play. Yeah, then uh, 20, 2017, again, you played your last ODI against Bangladesh, was it, again, in, in Dublin? You, I know you were involved in the in the Champions Trophy squads, but you didn't Yeah, I didn't play, no. Um, you came to the I should, have played, I should have played at Edge Beston, but that's that's a different discussion. <laughs> yeah, you came to the decision just to, to then call it call an end to Yeah, look, yeah. they were getting into a World Cup year. Um and they didn't need a thirty eight year old, thirty nine year old heading into a World Cup year. They didn't need um they needed to at that point they needed to blood who they wanted for that World Cup in White Ball Cricket. They needed to make sure that they invested it. This is my thoughts anyway. Their, their time and the Satners, the Sodis, the Estels, the guys that they wanted to take to a World Cup and make sure that they had the most playing opportunities between that series, that Champions Trophy and the World Cup here in England. Um, and so, look, I, I knew I wasn't going to play much in the Champions Trophy. I sort of, I knew I was sort of there as cover slash, you know, I knew the knew the grounds and knew what was, what was happening where. Um, so, it was a shame not to play in that series. I would have loved to have played at Edge Baston against Australia. Um, and I think I should have, but look, that's another argument, like I said. Um, but then I just, I realised during that, I was like, look, I'm done. It's, this isn't for me anymore. I'm 38. Well, I'm going to be turning 38. Um, these guys have their whole careers in front of them. And I'm not going to, I'm only going to be, I'm just going to be getting in the way. Um, for the next six months, so why bother? And then talk us through the transition into coaching. You've been involved around the England setup. Talk us through it. Is it a huge passion of yours, something that you just want to carry on in the years ahead? Oh, look, I mean, for 35 years, I've played cricket. 
um, well, yeah, 37 years I've played cricket, you know, since a three-year-old and I've always had a bat or a ball in my hand and um, it, it doesn't change now. And my passion for cricket will forever remain. I will always be um, that guy who celebrates hard and, and hurts hard when he loses. But um, look, I, I think now's my time to give back to a, a game uh, to a lifestyle that's given me so much, given me and my family so much. It's allowed us to travel the world. It's allowed us to have a home to kids that are very healthy and happy, um, to have a whole lot of support, you know, to be able to build a career around a sport is, is pretty lucky. And to now I have an opportunity to give back to that sport. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily giving back as much. It's basically just enhancing what's already there. And I have an opportunity to do that. Um, and I want to fulfill that. And to get that role with England was amazing. Um, I was very lucky to have that opportunity. And I hope that those opportunities keep keep coming because I'd love to love to be involved in such a special group who are trending. Let's be honest, England are, are a trending side after winning a World Cup and leading into two more T20 World Cups and an Ashes series. And there's so much coming up. Um, so it'll be awesome to be involved and in, to continue to be involved with them. However, we all know that COVID's hit us all very hard um, and it might be just time just to sit back and relax and reflect on what's been a really cool time. And then a word on the spinners, spin bowlers globally, There's talent out there. Oh, of course, mate. There's, they're everywhere at the moment. I mean, I'm sure you watch the IPL and, you you know, they're, they're everywhere. They're, they're doing some amazing things with the ball and asking some very tough questions. But ultimately, um, I, I feel that what they do is just do the simple things well over and over again. And, and it's trying to, I suppose my message would be to guys coming through now is to make sure that we nail that. We nail how simple we can be time and time again. Um, how many honest questions can we ask day in, day out of ourselves and the opposition when we play? Um, and then from there, let the game play the game because, you know, we'll never be able to control Mother Cricket. Um, but if we start to mess with it, then she'll find a way to mess with us. Is there one player that you, a youngster that, that's on the rise that you've got your eye on to say that he's going to be? Ah, uh, well, there's quite a few, mate. Um, I, I like I like what Amar Verdi's got. Um, to be honest with you, I really do like what he's got. Um, Moriarty from Surrey looks like he's got some good stuff as well. Um, you know, there's so many good guys around, um, but they're all just good in their own little right at the moment. And I think um, for them to develop and to keep getting um, better is to keep wanting to explore different opportunities and, and play more 2020 cricket, more 50 over cricket, more Red Bull cricket, but being also understanding along the way that um, not to lose who they are and what they are um, and to make sure that they keep enhancing that solid block but beneath them. Um, and that'd be my big thing is that, you know, the Don Besses, the Jack Leeches, the the, the guys that are involved in the moment in terms of Red Bull cricket, Parkinson, Rashid, Mo Ali. I mean, no one's no one owns a spot. Um, I don't feel anyway. No one will ever own a spot in an England shirt or or an Indian shirt or a or a Pakistani shirt or whatever. Um, they, all they do is just hold it for the next person to come through. And and I think that these guys coming through need to really focus on. Um, how they're going to win their moment right now, but with that in the in the fore, in the in the back of their minds of how they're going to make that shirt theirs. And then just to end on, if a youngster came to you for one piece of advice, <laughs> what would it be? I've said it to you, mate. Just bowl, bowl, and bowl, and bowl, and bowl. And when you finish, when you think you've had enough of bowling, bowl again. Um, it's probably one thing that got drummed into me when I was a kid. Uh, my dad used to set me a task every day before he'd come home from work is to make sure I'd hit the top of off six times before I came in and had my dinner. And he wasn't trying to be nasty. Um, he just wanted me to make sure that I knew how to do it. Um, I knew exactly what I needed to do when to be able to hit the top of off. And it wasn't bowling spin. It was trying to swing the ball away. So back in those days, pitch and middle hit the top of off. And, you know, I mean, if you can do that now, you're a genius. But um, that, was, that was all I needed to do um, day in, day out. Six balls, just do that before you come in. Um, and it just taught me to bowl. Perfect, Jeetan. Thank you very much for your time today. Fantastic no insight into your career and some fantastic also tips that you've given for young spinners and cricketers alike. Thank you, Neil. I appreciate it, mate. Perfect. So Neil Kagram, Cricket Last Stories, Jeetan Patel. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.